shouldn't. So, Lord, would you forgive us from our sins? Allow us to focus on your word today. May, be nourished, may, be, may our hearts be nourished by it. Uh, bless that as he preaches later. Bless, bless uh, Jeff as he's teaching the other class. Uh, and bless us all as we uh, read from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, good morning. We are, as I was saying, in chapter 6. So, if you would open your Bibles, uh, Romans chapter 6. This is a lesson that was mostly intended for the youth. So, I have adapted it a little bit for the adult audience. What does that mean? It means that I'm going to explain a little bit more of the Greek, a little bit of uh, uh, context. Uh, there's going to be some stuff that are very basic, uh, but we need to learn the basics. And for all of those who have learned the basics, we need to be reminded of the basics because we are forgetful and uh, we need to be constantly thinking about these things. So just a fair warning, this is, this is, uh, I think this is a great lesson. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at chapters, uh, uh, chapter 6, verse 1 through 6, and it says like this. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So let me give you an illustration just to begin with. And uh, hopefully you can re uh, relate to this. We're going to come back to this illustration uh, at the end. So <clears throat> we have this fictitious character that I'm going to call Jasper. And before salvation, Jasper was spiritually dead at the bottom of the ocean of sin. And this ocean of sin is, is very deep. It's completely dark. It's extremely cold and devoid of any kind of life. And, and, and Jasper could not feel, uh, he could not breathe, he could move only in the direction that the, that the sin was, was moving him. So sin commanded his every move, and he was just there, laying and, and at the expense of sin. But one day Jesus Christ plunged deep into the ocean of sin. He grabbed Jasper and brought him out of that place. And as soon as they reached the surface, the Lord made Jasper spiritually alive. So Jasper, at this moment, was able to see, he was able to breathe, he was able to feel for the very first time in his life. Jasper has been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the bright and warm and beautiful dominion of God. And amazingly enough, after plunging deep into the ocean of sin, Jesus Christ is completely dry, well, Jasper, obviously, is soaking wet. So, <clears throat> we are just like Jasper in this example. So, let's see uh, how does this relate to our text today. So, verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? It seems very likely that this question was raised in response to the words that Paul said in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, where he said, But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Unfortunately, at this moment in time, there is a group of people who completely misunderstood the doctrine of justification by faith. They believed that this doctrine provided an excuse to live a lifestyle of sin. They thought this was a license to continue doing things that were abhorrent to the Lord. And these people thought that the best thing they could do was to give God more opportunities to show grace, to display His grace. So, so if they give the Lord more opportunities to, to display His grace, that will give Him more, more glory. This is the rationale that some of these people were using. Uh, you had other people, uh, uh, Jewish, that they could not fathom a life in which you could please the Lord without strictly following the law. And, and you have all sorts of misunderstandings here, and I'm assuming, for what I have read, that Paul got this complaint often, everywhere he went. And the main issue here is this, is, this, this gospel that you're preaching, Paul is a license to sin, and, and, and we don't agree with it. 
But sadly, these ideas are completely twisted. They are wrong, and they are the complete opposite of what reality is. And, and these thoughts only demonstrate a profound ignorance of what grace means. And this also demonstrates how strong the temptation to sin is. Even after a person has been transformed into a new creature in Christ, he or she still has a bent towards sin. So that makes us all prone to sin. We, we are weak, and we need to recognize that we cannot overestimate our ability to control sin, and we should not underestimate the power that sin still has. So <clears throat> with that in mind, let us look at this question that Paul is asking here. Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Well, the key to understand this question is that this verb in Greek, which is epinomen, which means to continue in a, in a particular state or to continue in an activity. So when Paul is talking about to continue, to continue in sin, he's not talking about this occasional sin that you and I may commit when we say something we shouldn't have, when we thought about something we shouldn't have thought, or when we did something that, you know, it was not correct. This is not what Paul is talking, talking about. This is not a, a, a sporadic thing. The issue that Paul is addressing in this verse is willful, intentional sin. Paul is talking about a continuing pattern of life that is characterized by sin. That's what Paul is trying to address. And before we uh, move forward, I need to make a quick review of what justification and sanctification is. So let me begin with sanctification. I mean, justification, I'm sorry. <clears throat> justification, at the moment of faith in Jesus Christ, we are declared righteous. That the moment that a person believes, right there and then, this person is declared righteous, this person is, is made uh, right before God, and therefore is justified. And as I mentioned, justification uh, um, occurs in a moment. It's a particular moment. It's instantaneous, and it is once and forever. You're justified once, and that's it. You do not lose it. On the other hand, you have sanctification. And sanctification is not an event. It is a process. And this process of sanctification is a process by which God makes us more like his son, Jesus Christ. It is a process by which God makes us holy, makes us more like his son. So as a result of this process, our lifestyles are changing. Our, our, our lifestyles are improving every day of our lives, improving in the, in the spiritual sense. You might not become richer. You might not become healthier, but you become holier. That's the point here. This is what matters. So sanctification is <clears throat> instantaneous. And uh, I'm sorry, justification is instantaneous. Sanctification is a process. And the, the, the implication here is that even though we have been saved, even though we have been made right with God, we are justified, we are being sanctified. So <clears throat> we are prone to wonder, like the hymn says, we're prone to fall into sin. So the, another way to formulate the question that Paul is, is, um, is uh, uh, asking here is, are we to continue living in sin as if we had never been saved in order to receive more grace from God? This is the, this is the bottom that Paul is trying to get to. Are we to continue behaving as if Christ was not your, your master? So <clears throat> in my opinion, Based on what I know about Paul, there is no question that he's asking a rhetorical question, but he's also as, asking this with a certain degree of sarcasm, because uh, uh, this question is not only incongruent with the scriptures, it's also ridiculous, and the answer is obviously, it's an obvious and resounding no. Obviously not. And we see that in verse 2. May it never be, said Paul, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? So here, this, this uh, may it never be, it's important that we recognize this is a, this is a Greek expression that says megenoito, uh, which means absolutely not, certainly not, all caps, double uh, uh, exclamation point. I mean, there is no way. So it's a very emphatic, very strong, very forceful negation that Paul is trying to, 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 to convey here. 
That's why I'm giving you this, uh, uh, so that you understand the context. It's, 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 a, it's a brutal force that Paul is applying to, to respond to his own question. So the idea that we should sin more in order to receive more grace was as dangerous as a metastatic cancer. It needed to be uprooted. It needed to be dealt with swiftly and quickly, decisively, and, and, and you can leave no trace of it behind. It needs to be completely wiped out. And that's exactly what Paul is, is doing here. He does not want us to consider, even for a moment, that this idea of sinning more to give more grace to God is in any way, shape, or form acceptable. So, <clears throat> after he makes this very strong negation, Paul's, Paul uh, uh, follows up with another question. He says, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? So. Before I explain what Paul means with this question, it is necessary to, again, remind us of, of, uh, of how is it that humanity is born into sin? How is it that we are sinful? And if you remember, after the fall of Adam in Genesis 3, each and every one of us that has been born after then, we have been born under the mastery of sin. And since we are all slaves to sin, it is impossible for us to live a life apart from sin, like Jasper. He is completely submerged into these waters of sin, and he moves the way sin moves him, and he's completely incapable of moving in any other way because sin controls every aspect of his life. So that's, that's why we are like that. Sin is our master, and we have no other option but to obey. That's our reality. However, for those of us who have been saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, we have been freed from that dominion of sin. Sin is no longer our master. Scripture says that we have died to sin. And since believers have died to sin, our life is no longer defined by this sin. We now belong to Christ. He is our master. He is our, our savior. We now obey him, not sin. That is the difference. It's a, it's a massive difference. And again, this does not mean that believers do not sin because obviously we are capable of sin. And we, in fact, we do. So believers are very capable of sin, and we do it often, sadly. <clears throat> However, we now have the ability to recognize that sin. We now know what sin looks like. We now know that sin is abhorrent to the Lord. We now know that we should not do these things, and when we commit them, we know it. And we repent from that, and we can pray for, uh, that the Lord would forgive us for our sins. That is, that is monumental. So, in Christ, believers now have the ability to reject sin and obey God. This ability do not, it do not, does not exist when we're dead in our transgressions. So, anyway, once we establish that, this is how we are born into sin. This is our condition when we are sinful, when we are not saved. Now, going back to the opening illustration, what Paul is asking here is, if Jasper has been rescued from the bottom of the dark, cold, and lifeless ocean of sin, why would he want to go back there? You were rescued. You were taken out of there. You are now here with the Lord. Why do you insist in going back to this place? It makes no sense. The point that Paul is getting to is a person saved by grace cannot continue living as he, he was still living uh, 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 under sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. We're completely new. We're completely different. That's what Paul is saying. That's what Paul is wondering out loud. It makes no sense. Verse 3, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? The first half of this verse contains the key to understand what Paul is saying. And it's uh, the word in, in baptism. Baptizo means literally <clears throat> to plunge or to dip. Uh, 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 so, so if you think about um, like a strawberry that is dipped into chocolate, that's, uh, that's baptized into chocolate. Or, or, a, or a ship that sinks to the bottom of the sea, it, it becomes baptized into the sea. That is the, 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 that is the idea of this, of this word. So it has the idea of, of complete submersion into a liquid, because it was also used of submersion in, our, in alcohol. But in this case, we're talking about submersion into a liquid, which means it, it's water. So being baptized into Christ Jesus 
means that the believer has been immersed or dipped into Christ. It has been, the, the believer has been put inside of Christ. So this phrase is also parallel to Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, where Paul said, For all of you who were baptized into Christ, who have clothed, for all of you who were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. So you've been wrapped up by Christ. When you are clothed with something, you get invo involved by it. So <clears throat> the idea in both verses is that the believer has been fully joined with Christ. The believer is unified with Christ. So what Paul is describing here is a change in our identification. Before, in our fallenness, before our salvation, we were identified with Adam, and again with his fallenness, and we, are, and we were identified with his sin. So that's why we were all fallen. We were all in Adam. We were all sinful. But at the moment of faith, we become identified with Christ. So we change from the bottom of the darkness to the top where it is bright and warm, from sin into life, which is Christ. So <clears throat> I believe that a good illustration of our baptism would be, our, our baptism into Christ would be the, the ark, Noah's ark. If you remember, uh, uh, Noah builds this ark with this massive box to accommodate animals and, 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 uh, and the people that the Lord chose. So at some point, they all go in there, into the ark, and the Lord is the one who closes you know, the ark after the last passenger goes in. The Lord closes is like the stamp of approval. Everyone that is in there is because I chose them to be in there. No one else comes in. So the Lord closes the ark. Everybody is immersed into the, that ark. And when the rain begins and when the waters start raging, everybody that is dipped into that place, immersed into that ark, is completely protected from the wrath that was raging outside. So that is, uh, um, that, that is how we are in Christ. We are inside of him, and he's taking the wrath that was due to us. So <clears throat> that's kind of our experience compared to... Uh, uh, to the ark. So we are immersed into Christ. We're fully joined or united with him. And <clears throat> we see here in the second uh, half of verse three, that says that we have been baptized into his death. So <clears throat> throughout the years, there has been controversy among many scholars over the meaning behind that we have been baptized. And some, be uh, some believe that Paul meant that he was speaking about uh, uh, baptism in the spirit. And some other people say, no, no, this, he's talking about water baptism. So my conclusion here is that have been baptized refers primarily to water baptism. However, the idea of, of baptism by the Spirit is, is implicit there. Why? Well, because only those who have believed, only those who are in Jesus Christ get baptized. If you have not been saved, you do not get baptized. All right? And I'm not talking about you know, other cults and, and and sects and, 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 and pseudo-Christianity. Uh, I'm talking about real believers. If you're not saved, you do not get baptized. So one fact that cannot be ignored is that unlike today, in Paul's time, there was no such a thing as an unbaptized believer. If you believe, you get baptized. There is no other way around that. So <clears throat> this, uh, uh, of course, does not mean that the water saves us. The, the, the right of, of of baptism, of dipping someone into the water and bringing them up, that doesn't save anyone. That's not what, what's, uh, what's at stake here. Water baptism is an initiation, right? It's a profession of Christian faith. It's a public profession of what's happening in our heart. It's an outward demonstration of the inside change that has occurred. That is water baptized. So if indeed a believer has been fully joined or united with Christ, if the fate of Christ is also our fate, then it would not only be reasonable, but it would also be logical to conclude that when Christ died to sin, so were we. So would every believer. We are in him. Whatever happens to Christ happens to us. So those of us who believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior have died to sin. Our union with Adam and our union with sin has been severed. It is no more. And now we are united in Christ. As I said, it's a radical change in identification, in ownership, in mastery, in obedience. It all changed radically in a moment. So far, Paul has already established then 
that our baptism into Jesus Christ united us with him. And we saw that when Christ died to sin, believers also died to sin. And now, in verse 4, we will see that believers have also been buried with Christ. Verse 4, Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. So, here we have two implications to our burial with Christ. The first is that our death to sin is true and final. And the second implication is that our identification with Adam again, our identification with sin, has been severed and it's done forever. Something I need to mention here is that in, this, in these five verses and then in the next six, you're going to see a lot of repetition. It's, it, Paul is building up his case. So he goes and he teaches. And then he goes back and teaches, you know, point one and two gives you three. Point one, two, three. And then he keeps on building and repeating. So <clears throat> we have our identification with sin and with Adam severed. And this means that if believers died to sin, if believers have been set free from the mastery of sin uh, over their lives, it is therefore impossible for believers to continue living a life that is characterized by sin, that everything in your life screams of sin, that everything that you do points to sin. That is what Paul is saying. Sin can no longer be the pattern of our lives. Again, I need to make this very clear. This, he's not talking about our occasional sin. And I know that some of us might, might, might do more sinful things than others, but that's not what I'm talking about. This is talking about a pattern. Every moment of your life, every aspect of everything you do is sinful. That is a pattern. This is, not, this is, this is what Paul is talking about, a pattern of life. So Paul continues in verse 4, saying that Christ was raised from the dead. He says, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. So, <clears throat> thankfully, our death and burial were not the end of the story. In God's plan of, for salvation, after our burial, we have been resurrected. Just like Christ, believers were raised from the dead by an act of God through Christ. And when Christ was resurrected, so were we, which is marvelous. Because we did not just remain dead in, 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 inside a hole. We came back to life with him. So this act of God was nothing less than a demonstration of power and glory. And I want you to think about these two, these two words, a demonstration of power and glory. And this should lead us to two corollaries in our minds of, of what this implies. Number one is that this reiterates the fact that we had absolutely nothing to do with our salvation. It's something that we did not seek. It's something we did not earn. And most importantly, it's something we did not even deserve. That's the first thing that needs to come to our minds. And, and the second one, uh, uh, <clears throat> I need to say this, it's, uh, it's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is a gift of God. It is not of you. It was him. It was the Lord all along. So <clears throat> the second corollary, the second implication is that only God has the power to give life. We do not have that power. And we can see it through history. When someone loses a loved one, would you not want to bring him back to death, from, from the dead? Absolutely. But we don't have that power. We are incapable. But God can. God can speak things into existence. He can speak life. So God is the only one that gives life. And, and the implication is that if you know the Lord Jesus Christ and if you have read the Gospels and you have seen the Lord saying, hey, Lazarus, race and go. And this, this dead body there comes back to life and goes. So Jesus Christ has to be God as he says he is because he not only said it, he demonstrated it. Only God can give life. Therefore, Jesus Christ must be God himself. And in fact, <clears throat> Jesus himself said in John chapter 10, verses 17 through 18, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken, has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. 
Only God has that kind of authority. That's what we need to see. That's, what, that's where we're pointing to, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then Paul concludes verse 4 with the main point of the verse, which is this. The th- death and resurrection of Christ has brought us new life. So this is when we get to the summit. So we too might walk in newness of life, says Paul. And as we saw in the previous verses, before salvation, we identified with Adam in his fallenness, in his sinful state, and we were under the rule of sin. But now, through baptism into Christ, believers have been freed from the mastery of sin, and we now belong to the Lord. And at the moment of faith, believers cease to be united or identified with Adam, and now we are united or identified with Christ. So our resurrection in Christ has now given us a newness of life. Those who are saved received from the Lord a new heart. We receive a new spirit. We receive a new name. All those things. The moment that Jasper you know, reached the surface, he received newness of life with a new heart, with a new spirit, with a new name. Completely different, completely new. Therefore, believers in Jesus Christ are a new creation. He's, he didn't go in there to refurbish our old hearts, to refurbish anything. He removed the old and put brand new equipment in there, a brand new heart, a brand new spirit. So we are a new creation, entirely different. We have a new life. And this newness of life, in fact, demands that the believer demonstrates a radical change in his lifestyle. That is the implication here. There is a radical change, and that radical change is evident in the way we live. No, live, sorry. So our new life in Christ makes it impossible for the believer to live a life that is controlled by sin. We do still drip our sin. We're still wet from that sin, all right? But we're drying little by little over time but you cannot act as if you were still submerged into the water. That's the point here. So if this was not the case, if we were not continually trying to avoid sin, if we were not trying to, to, to address this sin constantly, if we just let sin just go rampant in our life and we just do as we please, because sinful, uh, sin is pleasure uh, sin, and sin feels, uh, makes us feel good, then there has not been a change. And then there is reason to, to, to think there's something wrong in this person's heart because they are doing nothing to address this sin because they just let sin control everything they do. So <clears throat> Luke says in, in chapter 6, verse 45, that the mouth speaks from that which fills the heart. So <clears throat> I believe that this is the point that Paul wants to get Uh, 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 across. If salvation indeed occurred, there will be evidence of it. And you cannot help it. It has to be. There has to be evidence that you have a new heart. John chapter 15, verse 4, the Lord Jesus said, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. So it is not up to us. It is up to the Lord. A vine cannot bear, a branch cannot bear fruit of itself. You cannot do it on your own unless it abides in me. You cannot do it on your own unless you're mine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. That's what the Lord says. That's the point that we have here. If salvation indeed occurred, you cannot go back to it. There's, there's no way. It's impossible for you. You are a new person. You're different. So now, in the first half of verse 5, Paul explains what he said in, in the previous verse. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death. So the literal translation for, uh, of the Greek says, for if we have become identified in the likeness of his death. That, that would be the literal translation. Not, uh, not united, identified with him. However, the major versions of the scriptures, which would be the New American, the English Standard, the um, NIV, uh, they all translate it as united with. 
And the reason for this different translation is that this conveys the full idea of union with Christ. So <clears throat> then uh, um, the we have become is an intensive perfect tense. And why do we have to go through the grammar? It's boring. It's irrelevant. It's really not. Let me tell you why. Because <clears throat> an intensive perfect is used to emphasize the results of an event that occurred in the past, but still has implications in the present. That's why I'm telling you this, so that you appreciate the full idea of what Paul is telling us here. So something that happened in the past, in our case, is over 2,000 years ago, it still has implications for you today, 2020. This is amazing. I mean, I mean this, is not, this is not a conspiracy. This is a miracle. So the Lord sacrificed, was sacrificed 2,000 years ago, and we have here the consequences today of his actions. So with this phrase, in the likeness of his death, Paul explains the way by which every believer is united with Christ. At the moment of faith, we become identified with Christ, we become united with him, and this means that when Christ died and he was buried, so were we. And then Paul concludes verse 5 telling us that believers are united with Christ now in his resurrection. So he gave us the whole progression. And I tried to plug in the things that we didn't have here. We become united with him in, in faith, at the moment of, of faith. And then when he died to sin, we died to sin. When he was buried, we were buried. And now we see that when he resurrected, so were we. So <clears throat> something that is word. Uh, 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 noting here is that our union, our likeness with Christ is not absolute. We're not exactly as he was. While it is true that Christ is fully man and he experienced all the effects of living into the fallen world, dipping into the ocean of sin, a key distinction is that he remained sinless and we, we are not. When he dipped into that sin, which is coming here into this world, he remained sinless, and he came out completely dry. And like Jasper, we came out soaking wet. That is a key difference. And adding to this uh, uh, list of differences between Christ and us is that he is also fully God. We are not God. We are children of God, but we do not claim equality with the Lord. So those two things I need to point out because it's, it's, it's not a, a, a one by one a correlation. There is a major difference between the Lord and ourselves, and for that we are grateful. So our union with God allows for many wonderful privileges, but as I said, equality to God, it's not one of those. And now this brings me back to the opening illustration. When there was a time when you and I, like Jasper, were dead in our transgressions and sins, and we were enslaved to sin, and we were unable to follow any other pattern of life, except for the one that sin dictated you know, in our lives. And the worst thing of it all is that, is that there was nothing that we could do to improve our situation. We could not escape it. We didn't even want to escape it. We didn't even know we were dead. Our spiritual death was evident in our speech, in our actions, in our thoughts. Everything I remember doing before I came to Bibliothek Chapel is probably not even worth mentioning because my mom is right there and I don't want her to know about that. <laughs> But horrible. I don't even want to think about this thing. So everything in my life demonstrated that I was just astray, that I was not a believer. Our lives as a whole, as mine was, was characterized by sin. But one day the Lord Jesus Christ came looking for me, looking for us. And he pulled us out from the bottom of the ocean of sin. He rescued us from the mastery of sin. He made us a spiritual life. He, made, he gave us a new heart, a new spirit, a new name. He gave us a new life. He made us a new creation, like Corinthians says. And Paul tells us here that believers have undergone a radical change in circumstances. Completely different person. We have been transformed from the kingdom, uh, transferred and transformed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Unfortunately, throughout the history of the world, there have been many, many, many people, and even today, who insist in living a life of sin, who insist on living as if they had never been saved. And these people keep going back into the ocean of sin. These people go back to the beach, they go into the water, and they swim as far down as they can, 
and they stay there for as long as they can. Why would you do that, says Paul? That's the question. Why would you insist in going back? Do you not know that you do not belong there? It is not going to be very long before the extreme cold and the darkness, and most importantly, your need to breathe, are going to, are going to force you to go back up. But then they go back down. Why do you do that? So <clears throat> why do you insist in trying to go back to the place that was emphatically trying to destroy your soul? That is the question. So what Paul wants us to know, the message that you need to learn from today is that you need to stay above the ocean of sin, stand on the solid rock where there's everlasting life and where you are in the presence of the Lord. That's what we need to remember from the lesson. A believer in Jesus Christ cannot and will not disregard the inspiration, the inerrancy, and the absolute authority of the scriptures. Therefore, a believer will always recognize the authority that the scriptures have over his life, and we will affirm the authority of God, and we will yield to his word. And as a result of all this, we will strive to live a life that is pleasing to God. We will strive to live a life that is in accordance to what he dictated in the word of God. We might fall into sin for periods of time, absolutely. But if the Lord brings it to our attention, the moment we hear the rebuke from the word of God, you have no other choice but to just stand down and yield and obey. That's what a believer would do. If you're here without Christ, I have really bad news. Or if you're watching, because I think there are people watching. The bad news is that you're spiritually dead. You're deep in the ocean of sin. You, have, you are a slave to sin, and worst of all, you are an enemy of God. That's the worst part. Being dead is the least of your concern. You're an enemy of God, and the problem that you face now is that our God is a righteous God, and He's a holy God who cannot and will not tolerate sin. And it gets worse. God is not going to let sin go unpunished. The penalty for sin is eternal death in hell. Hell is a real place. Nobody likes to talk about it. And in, sec in the secular world, they dismiss it altogether. But this is a dangerous idea to not acknowledge the existence of this place because it does exist. Hell is a real place. And in fact, the Lord Jesus Christ spoke about hell more than he spoke about heaven. And not only that, he describes it more vividly than heaven. Jesus said that hell is a place of eternal torment in the book of Luke. And then he says in Mark that it's the unquenchable fire. And then also in Mark, he says, this is the place where the worm does not die, where people will gnash their teeth in anguish and regret, and from which there is no return, even to warn the loved ones. All of this are the words of the Lord, not mine. Horrible place, horrible destiny without Christ. But this is the very good news. God is so infinitely merciful and gracious that in Ezekiel 33, 11, he says, As I live, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn away, <clears throat> turn from his way and live. And then the Lord says, Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. When will you, why then will you die, O house of Israel? The Lord is pleading with you. You do not have to die. Come to me. I do not take pleasure in, in, your, in your destruction. Like many people think that God would send someone you know, to hell just for his own pleasure. The Lord himself says, I do not take the, the pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. In fact, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This, this son is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one and only Savior who said, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. What more assurance do you need? 
the king of the universe is saying, come to me. I am not a master like sin. My yoke is, is, is easy and my burden is light. If you come to me for your salvation, I'm not going to reject you. So come to Christ for the salvation that you desperately need. He will not reject you. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Son, God himself says, come to me, I will not reject you. So flee to the cross today so that you too may have eternal life. Let's give thanks. Father, we thank you for the reminder of the things that we ought to be doing, the things that we should not be doing, and most importantly for the reminder of how merciful and gracious you have been to us. Thank you for the salvation that we have in your Son. We thank you for your word that made it possible for us to know about your, your Son and your plan for salvation and everything about you that we know. It comes from the Scriptures, Lord, so would you allow us to cherish, cherish your word, um, read it, know it, hide it in our hearts that we may um, be able to live a life that is um, pleasing to you. So Lord, would you please uh, be with all those who are here uh, that are your children, and Lord, we also lift up those who might be watching or listening that have not been saved, that, that you would give them a new heart, a newness of life that may be able to uh, enjoy uh, eternity with you, to call you uh, Father, and most importantly, to have a relationship um, with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.